osteoporosis um, is now a widely recognized is widely recognized as a progressive systemic disease characterized by low bone density, osteopenia, and a micro architectural deterioration of the bone that predisposes the patients to increased bone fragility and fracture. Because of decreased bone mass, fragility, fractures result from trauma that would not cause a normal bone to fracture. Osteoporosis of the spine may lead to crowding of internal organs, spinal cord compression, GI disorder, disorders, or restrictive lung disease. Increased mortality and morbidity are associated with limited physical activity, back pain, skeletal deformity, height loss, and kyphosis. Clinically significant osteoporosis of the spine is associated with significantly significant morbidity, reduced quality of life, and soaring medical costs. Women are more susceptible to osteoporosis because of their peak bone mass tends to be 10 to 30 percent less than that of males. The prevalence of osteoporosis in men increases after the age of 80. Men have a shorter lifespan than women, so they account for only 21 percent of the hip fractures. By the age of 90, only about 17 percent of men have had a hip fracture compared to 32 percent of women. Osteoporotic fractures present as a clinical significant derangements in bone. They result from low energy trauma such as falls or sitting or standing in one position and from high energy trauma such as a motor vehicle accident. Fragility fractures which occur secondary to low energy trauma are characterized by osteoporosis and may be the presenting problem uh, to the clinician. So what do we use uh, for medications to help um, prevent osteoporosis or treat osteoporosis? Uh, these include the biphosphonates, the hormones, as well as selective estrogen receptor modulators, or CIRMs. What are the indications uh, for osteoporosis in um, both men and women? Uh, osteopenia, Paget's disease, bone pain associated with severe osteoporosis. Um, the oste it includes the treatment and prevention of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women, treatment of osteopenia, which is the low bone mass. It's used to treat increased, uh, used to increase bone mass in the effort to reduce fracture risk. Uh, treatment in osteoporosis in men. Treatment of glucocortico-induced osteoporosis in both men and women, as well as the treatment of Paget's disease in men and women. So what are the mechanisms of action? Biphosphonates are non-hormonal agents that have an extremely high affinity for bone. Aldronate was the first of the newer biphosphonates to be approved by the FDA for the treatment and prevention of osteoporosis. Resondronate is the second biphosphonate to be approved for the treatment of osteoporosis. Ibandronate is the newest biphosphonate and may be taken on a monthly basis. Biphosphonates inhibit the activity of osteoclasts to normalize the rate of bone, bone turnover. This results in an indirect increase in bone mineral density. The biphosphonates are very specific to the skeleton. They reduce the risk for both vertebral and non-vertebral fractures without demonstrating other benefits outside of the skeleton. One exception is that ibrondronate, which is, has not been shown to significantly reduce the incidence of um, hip fractures. These agents are incorporated into the bone matrix but are not pharmacologically active thereafter. It is unknown whether incorporation um, of biphosphonates when released by resorption could eventually interfere with bone remodeling. The SERMs, another class, are used to treat um, patients with osteoporosis. This includes raloxifen and tamoxifen. However, raloxifen is the only one that is used for osteoporosis. 
Raloxifen was de designed to exert an estrogenic effect in bone, but not in reproductive tissue. It reduces resorption of bone and decreases overall burn bone turnover. Although raloxifen reduces the risk of developing vertebral fracture and increases hip and spine BMD, it has no significant effects on most intravertebral fractures, including hip fractures. Well, oxifen prevents endometrial thickening, reducing the risk of endometrial cancer, but it does not relieve the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. It may also reduce the risk of cardiovascular events by lowering low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. It seems to exert anti-estrogenic effects on breast tissue, which theoretically might decrease the risk of bre breast cancer. Raloxifen does, however, increase the risk of venous thermal embolism, similar to the traditional estrogen therapies. Hormones such as calcitonin is a naturally occurring hormone that is produced by C-cells in the thyroid gland. Although its mechanism of action in osteoporosis has not been fully delineated, calcitonin is known to block resorption of the bone through its potent inhibitory effects on osteoclasts. Calcitonin is a protein and therefore cannot be taken orally because it would be digested before it can work. Intranasal salmon calcitonin is 50 to 100 fold more potent than human calcitonin. Calcitonin lowers serum calcium concentration by primarily, um, primarily by direct inhibition of bone resorption. Osteoclasts are reduced in number and function, and osteoclast resorption is decreased. Calcitonin also has a direct effect on the kidneys. Through inhibition of tubular resorption, calcium and phosphate, as well as sodium, are increased. However, urinary calcium is decreased rather than increased in some patients because calcitonin-induced inhibition of bone resorption has a greater effect on calcium excretion than it does the drug's direct renal action. Um, synthetic human PTH, uh, terapatide was approved um, by the FDA um, for the treatment of osteoporosis that stimulates new bone formation. Once daily injections stimulated new bone formation on trabricular and cortical bone surfaces through preferential stimulation of osteoblastic activity over osteoclastic activity. This effect is manifested as an increase in skeletal mass and an increase in bone turnover markers. By increasing new bone formation, teraparatide improves bone mass and bone strength. BTH, PTH also acts on the kidneys by reducing renal clearance of calcium. Patients treated with PTH along with calcium and vitamin D supplementation have statistically significant increases in bone mineral, 10 to 20 percent after one and a half years at the spine and hip when compared to the patients only taking um, calcium and vitamin D. So what is um, the cardinal points of treatment? The primary goal of osteoporosis management is reduce the risk of fracture. Even when medication is initiated, non-pharmacological efforts must be continued as well. Um, activity to increase muscle and bone mass, strength and flexibility, and reducing hazards such as loose rugs, defective stairs, poor lighting, and obstacles in the environment that prevent uh, that present fall hazards. For pharmacological treatment, anti-resorptive agents, including the biphosphonates, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, raloxifen, calcitonin, denosumin, and an embolic agent teraparatide are currently available for osteoporosis treatment. All therapies should be given with calcium and vitamin D supplementation. These medications may be classified into two primary categories. The first includes medications to help stimulate bone formation, such as vitamin D and biphosphonates. And the second includes medications to reduce bone resorption, such as estrogen, biphosphonates, calcitonin, calcium, and vitamin D. Um, first line agents include alendronate, resendronate, zoldronic acid, 
um, enteroparatide. Um, second line agents include ibendronate and denosub. Second or third line agents include raloxifen. Last line agent includes calcitonin. Treatment for patients with very high risk a fracture or for whom biphosphonates therapy has failed, um, ditriparatide is used. Denosum and triparatide are often used for treating patients um, with the most severe problems. The AACE guidelines advise against uh, the use of combination therapy. The oral biphosphonates, aldronate, um, Ibandronate and Restronate are all effective for the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis and reducing the incidence of bone fractures for three to five years. Side effects and costs are similar, although Resperinate may be slightly less expensive. Side effects may increase with longer use. All must be taken on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, and the patient must remain upright and must not eat or drink anything for 30 to 60 minutes. Effectiveness has greatly decreased if the agents are not taken correctly. Low drug com compliance, low viability, viability, GI upset, and dyspepsia are frequent and may be significant enough to interfere with compliance. Some women are unable to take oral medications and will benefit from IV by Phosphonates. Weekly or monthly biphosphonates allow for a greater ease of dosing. Intravenous biphosphonates are excellent choices for patients intolerant of the oral biphosphonates or in those who are adherence is an issue. Ibandronate is given IV every three months. Zolandronate Ronic acid is given once a year by IV infusion to treat postmenopausal osteoporosis in women, but also is used for decreased bone mass in men. Zolandronic acid has been found to increase the risk of kidney failure and contraindicated with moderate to severe renal impairment. Co-administration with nephrotoxic or diuretic medications such as dehydration before or after taking a drug or advanced age. Um, is contraindicated. SERMs are considered to provide the beneficial effect of estrogen without the potential adverse outcomes. Raloxifen is effective in promoting bone density and has been added, has the added benefit of protecting patients against invasive breast cancer. It has been most useful in younger postmenopausal women with severe osteoporosis. Raloxifen side effects include hot flashes, severe leg muscle cramps, and threefold increase in relative risk of venous thromboembolism, with the greatest risk occurring in the first four months of use. Because immobilization increases the risk of venous thromboembolic events, independent of therapy, raloxifen is not indicated for women who are not fully ambulatory, and it should be discontinued for women who undergo prolonged immobilization. It is generally regarded as a second line treatment, but other but many clinicians do use it as first line. Calcitonin is a hormone used to treat osteoporosis because it decreases osteoclast activity. It is used in postmenopausal women to decrease bone loss. The hormone is delivered in a single daily 200 unit dose as an intranasal spray. Absorption of this drug may be irregular and is and as a, a less potent agent and is used primarily in women who choose not to use other therapies. Other than the expense, the nasal spray, spray is convenient and causes only mild side effects such as nasal irritation. Calcitonin is recommended in osteoporotic women after the first five years of menopause. It may be particularly useful in immobile patients who cannot sit up for the time required to take biphosphonate. Teraparatride, which is a human recombinant PTH134, is the only available anabolic agent used for the treatment of osteoporosis. When given continuously, it is associated with increased osteoclastic and osteoblastic turnover, leading to a net loss of bone. PTH given as a daily subcutaneous injection as reser is reserved for patients with severe osteoporosis who cannot toler tolerate or are unresponsive to other therapies. Patients who are at risk for osteosarcoma should not take um, PTH. 
safety and efficacy is not approved for use beyond two years of treatment. Denosumab is a newer drug consisting of humanized monoclonal antibody directed against receptor activity of nuclear factor kappa B ligand, um, which is a key mediator in the resorptive phase of bone remodeling. It decreases bone resorption and inhibiting osteoclastic activity. It is indicated for patients with postmenopausal osteoporosis for high risk for fracture, so it is not necessarily first line treatment for most women. Hormone replacement therapy was once considered a first line therapy for the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis. Although hormone replacement therapy is not currently recommended, it is important to mention because many osteoporosis patients in a typical practice still use it for controlling postmenopausal symptoms. Um, studies have shown that this can re human re Hormone replacement therapy can reduce fractures, but it also showed adverse outcomes associated with combined estrogen and progesterone therapy, such as breast cancer, myocardial infarction, stroke, and venous thromboembolic events, and estrogen alone, which increases the risk for strokes and venous thromboembolic events. Non-pharmacological treatment includes counseling all women on the risk of osteoporosis and related fractures, ensuring adequate diet or supplement of calcium in both men and women, recommend regular weight bearing and muscle strength and exercises to reduce the risk of falls and fractures, also consider foot care, shoe selection, eye care, and increased lighting in homes. Advise the patient to avoid tobacco smoking and excessive alcohol intake and recommend a BMD testing or bone mass density. Um, initiate therapy to reduce risk of, risk of fractures in postmenopausal women with bone mass density T-scores by central dual DXA below negative 2 in the absence of risk factors in a women with T-scores below negative 1.5 if one or more risk factors is present. Consider postmenopausal women with vertebral or hip fractures as candidates for osteoporosis um, treatment. How to monitor these patients? Creatinine um, should be done at baseline. Monitor levels of serum, calcium, and phosphorus prior to treatment initiation and yearly thereafter. Central bone mass density should be measured by DXA to establish the diagnosis of osteoporosis prior to treatment initiation and every two years to monitor therapy. Bone turnover markers should be monitored in patients taking biphosphonate therapy because they could become profoundly suppressed. The rate of bone loss can be monitored with a urine test, um, the NTX test, prior to treatment initiation, three months later, and yearly or whenever therapy is changed. The test measures urine levels of a compound linked to bone breakdown and samples should be collected at the second void of the day. Normal levels are less than 38. Uh, values above normal indicate a faster rate of blood, uh, bone loss. If therapy is effective, then subsequent tests will show decreased levels. A reduction of 30% or more NTX levels is considered a favorable response. Um, the, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommends that patients have a drug holiday after four to five years of biphosphonate treatment. If osteoporosis is mild or a fracture risk is low, a drug holiday of one to two years may be considered after 10 years of treatment. Periodic nasal exams performed to obscure crust, dryness, erythema, and irritation are recommended for patients receiving calcitonin nasal spray. Patients should undergo, undergo routine dental monitoring while taking the biphosphonate drugs. For, patients variab for patient variables, for geriatric patients, there's no overall differences in efficacy or safety between patients older than 65 and younger patients who are receiving any of these medications. For the calcitonin nasal spray, compared with patients younger than 65 years of age, the incidence of nasal adverse events such as rhinitis, irritation, erythema, and excoriation was higher in patients older than 65, particularly in those over the age of 75. 
for pediatric patients, safety and effectiveness of these medications in patients younger than 18 has not been evaluated. Terparatide should be used should not be used in pedi pediatric patients and in young adults with open epiphyses. For those pregnant and lactating women, al alindronate, risperinate, ibendronate, terparanide, and calcitonin are considered a category C. Zoldronic acid is a category D, and rofoxifen and estradiol is a category X. Rofoxifen Roloxifen, teraparatide, and transdermal estrogen are not indicated for premenopausal women. Roloxifen is contraindicated in women who are or may become pregnant. These agents are indicated only for postmenopausal women. Estrogen is known to decrease the quantity and quality of breast milk. It is not known whether aldronate, risperidinate, um, rofoxifen, or teraparatide paratide are excreted in human breast milk. The impact of these drugs have not been studied in nursing women, so they are not recommended um, for nursing mothers. Calcitonin has been shown to decrease, shown to cause a decrease in fetal birth weight in animals. It does not cross the placenta um, and is not indicated for use in pregnancy. Safety of use in lactation is unknown. Um, but calcitonin is distributed in breast milk. In animal studies, it has been shown to inhibit lactation. Um, when looking at race, pharmacokinetic differences due to race have not been studied. Osteoporosis is more common in whites and Asians than in members of other races. Darker skin races genetically are found to have denser bones. For gender, Biphosphonates, um, the bioavailability in pharmacokinetics following oral administration are similar in men and women. Safety and effectiveness of biphosphonates have been demonstrated in clinical studies in men being treated for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis and Paget's disease. Raloxifen um, shows no significant differences between age-matched men and women with the use. However, safety and efficacy has not been evaluated in men. For teraparatide, absorption occurs at a rate of approximately 20 to 30 percent lower in men than women, and estrogen is indicated only for the prevention of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women, but not for treatment. For patient education, um, include adequate um, have the patient include adequate amounts of calcium, 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams per day, vitamin D, 400 un international units, and general good nutrition in the diet. Weight-bearing exercises, particularly walking, should be encouraged along with modification of other risk factors for osteoporosis such as smoking and alcohol consumption. Medication use is not enough to prevent falls in the elderly. Specific fall prevention strategies should include um, weaning the elderly off polypharmacy. Um, evidence shows that being on five or more drugs increases the risk of falls despite the type of drugs. If the patients fall often enough, they eventually sustain fractures. Proper shoe wear, non-stick floors, and reduced use of stairs. Improved contrast lighting throughout the home and improved eye care should be, um, sh have been shown to reduce falls and subsequent fractures. Alondronate and risperidronate um, must be taking at least 30 minutes um, before um, and ibendronate must be taken 60 minutes before the first food, beverage, or medication is taken in the morning. To facilitate absorption, the biphosphonate should be taken with a full glass, six to eight ounces of plain water, and the patient should avoid lying down for 30 to 60 minutes thereafter to facilitate delivery to the stomach and reduce the potential for esophageal irritation. Rofoxifen can be taken without regard to food intake. Calcitonin nasal spray, um, advise a patient to pump on the pump assembly, pump priming, and use of the pump.
Any significant nasal irritation should be reported. Once the pump has been activated, the bottle may be maintained at room temperature for two weeks until the medication is finished. Explain the action of absorption through the mucosal membranes into the bloodstream to facilitate patient understanding of the mechanism of action and compliance with the medication. Calcitonin can be taken without regard to food or beverage intake. Teraparatide is administered by subcutaneous injection with a pre-filled delivery device. Instructions should be given to inject once daily into the thigh or abdomen. The agent can be injected at any time of day. Teraparatide should be refrigerated at 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit both before and after use. It should not be frozen and should be discarded if it has been frozen. The patient should not use the medication if it's discarded discolored or cloudy or has particles in it. They should not use after the expiration date um, has passed. One pen provides 28 days of medication. No food, beverages, or activities are restricted when this medication is taken. Data is not available on the safety and efficacy after drug is taken for longer than two years. Um, the adhesive side of the Menostar estradiol transdermal system should be placed on a clean, dry area of the lower abdomen. Menostar should not be applied to or near the breasts. The sites of application must be rotated with an interval at least one week allowed between applications to a particular site. The area selected should not be oily, damaged, or irritated. So specifically, the biphosphonates include aldronate, which is Fosamax, Rhizdronate, which is Actinel, Ibandronate, which is Boniva, and Aldronate Sodium Binosto, and finally, Zoledronic Acid Reclass. They're contraindicated in hypocalcemia, renal insufficiency, inability, inability to stand or sit upright for 30 minutes, abnormalities of the esophagus that delay emptying, such as stricture or achalasia, history of ulcer, PUD, or active PUD. Um, again, precautions, temporary or permanent discontinuation should be considered in patients with severe musculoskeletal pain. Patients must have adequate nutrition, calcium, and vitamin D. Hypocalcemia, vitamin D dis deficiency must be corrected before therapy is initiated. Severe bone, joint, and muscle pain has been reported in postmenopausal women. Osteonecrosis of the jaw with delayed healing has been reported in patients taking biphosphonates. Most cases have occurred in patients with cancer who have been treated with IV biphosphonates. But some have occurred in patients with postmenopausal osteoporosis. Precaution with um, in renal insufficiency. It's not recommended for patients with renal insufficiency with a creatinine clearance less than 35 milliliters per minute. Patients with renal impairment take an actinel uh, or beniva. Uh, creatinine clearance should be greater than 30 milliliters per minute. Um, anything less is not recommended. For pharmacokinetics, um, biophosphonates have an affinity for oxyapatite crystals in bone and act as anti-resorptive agents. Their primary mechanism of action involves inhibition of osteoclastic bone reabsorption. There are some adverse effects, including um, bilateral subtracanteric fractures and GI upset. Um, osteonecrosis, primarily of the jaw, is a rare dental condition in which the bone of the lower jaw is, or less commonly, the upper jaw becomes exposed and the wound fails to heal with a typical time frame. This is more common in patients with the IV form, but has been reported in patients taking oral biphosphonates. There is some drug-food um, interactions, 40% increase in risk of fractures among Patients taking protein pump inhibitors for a year or longer probably caused by decreased absorption of calcium from reduced stomach acid. 
A similar but smaller risk was found in patients on H2 blockers. These are poorly absorbed from the GI tract, so they should not be taken with food, drink, other than water. The incidence of adverse GI events is common and increased in, uh, in at the same time use of aspirin and non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Most drugs, especially calcium, albumin, and magnesium containing medications may interfere with absorption and should be separated one hour prior or two hours after taking the dose. Um, overdosages can occur, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, and upper GI adverse events such as upset stomach, heartburn, esophagitis, gastritis, or also may result from overdosage. Death has occurred with significant overdosage of both aldronate and resveratrolate in rats. Dosage and administration for Fosamax, osteoporosis treatment, 10 milligrams daily or 70 milligrams weekly. Um, osteoporosis prevention, 5 milligrams daily or 35 milligrams weekly. For Actimol, 5 milligrams daily or 35 milligrams weekly for osteoporosis. Um, and 5 milligrams once a week on day one, then 500 milligrams calcium is taken once daily food on days two to seven of each week. For Beneva, osteoporosis prevention and treatment, 2.5 milligrams daily or 150 milligrams monthly. Um, three milligrams IV given three months, um, every three months um, is also um, appropriate. For the calcitonin, um, again, um, contraindications, in, uh, allergy, um, to calcitonin um, and salmon. Because calcitonin is a polypeptide, the possibility of systemic allergic reactions exist. Skin testing should be considered um, prior to treatment for patients with suspected um, susceptibility. For pharmacokinetics, calcitonin is destroyed by the GI tract and therefore must be administered parenterally or intranasally. Um, it causes inhibition of osteoclast function with loss of osteoblast border responsible for the reabsorption of bone. It has also been shown to increase spinal bone mass in postmenopausal women with established osteoporosis, but not in women with early postmenopause. Um, Calcitonin is not recommended in osteoporotic women during the first five years of menopause because few data is available to support its efficacy during this period. There are a number of adverse effects and drug interactions that you need to um, become familiar with. Um, formal studies designed to evaluate drug interactions have not been done. Um, dosage osteoporosis 200 units daily intranasally alternating nasals daily nostrils daily calcitonin can be administered to IM or sub Q and dosed at 100 units every other day for um, PTH uh, it's contraindicated in um, hypersensitivity use precautions when treating patients with increased risk of osteosarcoma, such as those with Paget's disease of the bone or unexplained high levels of alkaline phosphatase in the blood. Patients from a pediatric or young adult population and anyone who has ever been given a diagnosis of bone cancer or other cancers with metastasis to the bone has had radiation therapy involving the bone has had a metabolic bone disease other than osteoporosis or had pre-existing hypercalcemia. Transient episodes of orthostatic hypotension has been observed infrequently, but these resolve spontaneously and do not preclude continued treatment. You also need to use caution in patients um, with active or recent urolithiasis to avoid exacerbation of the condition. Because of the transient increase in serum calcium use with caution, use with caution in patients who are taking digitalis. Um, pharmacokinetics, PTH is the primary regular, regulator of calcium and phosphate, phosphate metabolism in bone and kidney. Physiologic actions include regulation of bone metabolism, renal tubular reabsorption of calcium and phosphate, and intestinal calcium absorption. 
Once daily administration of PTH stimulates new bone formation via perfer preferential stimulation of osteoblastic activity over osteoclastic activity. Uh, adverse events usually are mild and do not require discontinuation. Overdosage has not been reported. Um, Dosage and administration for osteoporosis, 20 micrograms sub-Q daily in the thigh or abdominal wall. Um, has not been evaluated beyond two years of treatment, so the drug is not recommended beyond two years. Administer initially under circumstances where the patient can sit or lie down if symptoms of orthostatic hypotension occurs. It should be refrigerated at all times and should not be used if frozen. For the SERMs, um, these are contraindicated for any active or past history of uh, venous thromboembolic events, including DVTs, pulmonary emboli, and retinal vein thrombosis, or with prolonged immobilization. Now we'll move on to uh, the glucocorticoids. Um, remember that the adrenal cortex synthesizes and secretes several hormones. Among them are the glucocorticoid cortisols and the mineral corticoaldosterones and a small amount of the sex steroid androgen. Aldosterone, under the influence of the renin angiotensin system and other metabolic pathways, regulates sodium, potassium, and water retention in the body. Cortisol has, has a powerful anti inflammatory effect, modifies the body's immune response, and influences metabolic processes. The production of cortisol is controlled by negative feedback loops involving the hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, adrenal cortex. HPA axis. A low level of plasma cortisol stimulates the anterior pituitary to increase production of ACTH, which in turn stimulates the adrenal cortex to increase cortical secretion. Similarly, a high level of circulating cortisol prompts down regulation of ACTH production and a resultant decrease in adrenal cortex production of cortisol. Cortisol is naturally secreted in an uneven pattern over 24 hours, totaling 10 milligrams per day in a normal adult. Secretion is highest during the evening, early morning hours from 2 to 7 a.m., and lowest in the evening from 6 p.m. to midnight. Um, so we have short acting um, corticosteroids such as the hydrocortisone medium-acting, such as prednisone, and long-acting, such as dexamethasone. These are indicated for anti-inflammatory or immunosuppression. For diagnostic pur purposes, such as a suppression of ACTH production and the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome, as well as other uses. Mechanism of action, the glucocorticoids affect the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. They have a direct and indirect effect on the immune response, modulate inflammatory response, and play a role in the body's response to stressful stimuli, especially fasting states. All drugs in this class are remarkably similar and um, are discussed as a group. The most important differences between these drugs consist of the duration of action and degree of inherent um, mineral corticoid activity, which causes sodium and fluid retention. Mineral corticoid activity is needed in adrenal insufficiency, but not in severe inflammation. Both cortisone and hydrocortisone have glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid properties. Their synthetic analogs, prednisone, prednisolone, and methylprednisolone, have both effects as well as as well although glucocorticoid effects predominate. By contrast, triamphalone, dexamethasone, and betamethasone have exclusively glucocorticoid anti-inflammatory activity. These are used for carbohydrate and, meta and protein metabolism. 
glucocorticoids maintain an adequate level of serum glucose by stimulating gluconeogenesis in the liver and inhibiting peripheral glucose use. They also stimulate protein breakdown, which results in increased plasma amino acid levels in the liver. Amino acids enhance enzym enzymatic activity, which in turn supports increased glucagon de deposition and decreased glucolysis. This action intended to support hemostasis in the healthy body can result in a diabetogenic state when large doses of endogenous, exogenous glucocorticoids are used. Serum glucose rises in the fasting state, glucose tolerance decreases, insulin resistance develops, and glucosuria um, may be present. The result may be a clinical expression of latent diabetes or simply relative glucose intolerance while on steroid therapy. Increased protein breakdown mobilizes amino acids from muscle, bone, skin, and lymph tissues. Muscle atrophy, osteoporosis, impaired wound healing, and thinning of the skin may result. In children, growth can be impaired. It's involved in lipid metabolism. Uh, glucocorticoids affect the metabolism of fats from areas of depo deposition. Increased lipolysis occurs in areas of adipose accumulation and serum fatty acid concentration increases. Long-term use of steroid therapy may result in increased uh, um, deposition of adipose tissue in the back of the neck and the subclavicular area, sometimes described as a buffalo hump and in the cheeks and face referred to as moon faces. Relative loss of subcutaneous fat in the extremities may also be noted. Glucocorticoids mask the manifestation of both cellular and humoral immunity. Um, humoral immunity involves the interaction of B lymphocytes with macrophages and helper T lymphocytes to create antibodies. Glucocorticoids Glucocorticoids do not cause a decrease in the level of circulating antibodies, but may inhibit antibody creation by interfering with macrophage function and the production of activation of lympho lymphokines. Cellular immunity is mediated primarily by T lymphocytes. Glucocorticoids block several steps of the cascade of T cell activation and thereby impede their ability to mount an effective cellular immune response. This action is therapeutically is used therapeutically to block rejection after transplant. In addition, steroid administration has a direct effect on circulating white blood cells, causing a propped drop in the numbers of lymphocytes, monocytes, and eosinophils in circulation and an increase in the number of neutrophils. Lymphocytes are sequestered in lymph tissues and T cells are decreased in relatively greater numbers than B cells. Neutrophils are released from the marrow in greater numbers and are removed from circulation more slowly under the influence of exogenous glucocorticoids. Their net result is a dis redistribution of white blood cells rather than a true leukopenia. For the anti-inflammatory action, lymphocytes, macrophages, and lymphokines all play a role in modulation of the body's inflammatory response. Thus, the impact of exogenous glucocorticoids is an interactive one, but between the immune response and the inflammatory response. By many of the pathways mentioned earlier, glucocorticoids inhibit both early manifestations of inflammation, such as local edema, capillary dilatation, migration and activation of white blood cells, and phagocytosis, and the later effects including proliferation of capillaries and collagen disposition. It is the simultaneous inhibition of inflammation and the immune response that accounts for the effectiveness of glucocorticoids in the circumstances such as acute asthma and acute allergic reactions. However, practitioners must remain aware of the uh, risks of such suppression. Serious infection or an illness may be masked by the absence of the characteristic signs of an inflammation or immune system activation. Corticosteroids also um, work with a stress response, stressful stimuli such as surgery, fright, starvation, and abrupt physiological change prompt increased release of glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex and release epinephrine and norepinephrine from adrenal medulla. Glucocorticoids potentiate the effects of 
uh, catecholamines to raise heart rate, blood pressure, and blood glucose in activating the fight or flight responses. The other effects of glucocorticoids um, include indirect effects on the CNS, changes in mood, sleep pattern, and motor activity is seen. Typical mood changes involves upregulation or euphoria, but anxiety and depression occasionally occur in some patients. Really, a so-called steroid psychosis occurs, which resolves with discontinuation of the medication. The precise mechanisms that underlie these effects is unknown. The glucocorticoids increase hemoglobin concentration and increase the number of circulating red blood cells and platelets. They also impede the rate of growth in children. Many developing tissues, including brain, lung, liver, skin, and epithesis of long bones, are affected by inhibition of cell division and cell growth. Furthermore, glucocorticoid therapy can cause osteonecrosis for reasons um, that are poorly understood. Oral corticoid Glucocorticoids um, may increase the level of an enzyme that inactivates vitamin D, doubling the risk of vitamin D deficiency, which may present with uh, osteomalacia, rickets, or clinical myopathy, particularly in children. Glucocorticoids are a significant contributor to drug-induced osteoporosis. Vitamin D deficiency does not appear to pair with inhaled glucocorticoids. So what are the cardinal um, points of treatment? Short-term use, if the patient has been on the medication for a few days, it's not necessary to taper the dose before the patient stops taking it. However, long-term use requires a gradual reduction in the dosage before the patient stops taking it. Clinical decision and the use of glucocorticoids revolve around length and therapy and how the steroid use is stopped. The goal of treatment with glucocorticoids, other than as replacement therapy are to control symptoms of inflammation and prevent organ damage while minimizing serious adverse effects. When possible, glucocorticoids should, not, should be added to other forms of therapy rather than given alone. Most primary care uses of glucocorticoids call for short-term therapy less than two weeks two weeks or less. Steroid administration can suppress the hypothalamic pituitary axis, leaving the body compromised during periods of physiological stress because of complete or partial dependence on exo exogenous glucocorticoids. Use of oral or intramuscular glucocorticoids for less than two weeks, even at high doses, does not require a gradual decrease in dosage. Um, to discontinuation. However, it is standard that a two to three week course usually is tapered to prevent symptom recurrence. Long term, longer courses require a very gradual dosage reduction to avoid abrupt onset of symptoms or adrenal insufficiency. Recovery after HPA suppression can take up to 12 months. The use of short-acting agent and the alternate day dosing regimen should be considered for long-term therapy. Administration of a double dose every, every other morning has been found to cause less suppression of the HPA axis and less growth suppression in children. However, daily therapy is indicated for acute exacerbations of disease and for a limited number of conditions such as temporal arteritis and aphantiscus vulgaris. Providers should be careful in prescribing steroid injections um, in older women, particularly those who are prone to osteoporosis, as steroid increases the loss of hip bone mass and increases risk for fractures. The therapeutic administration is least likely to interfere with normal hormone production when the drug is given at a time of natural peak activity. It is generally recommended to administer the full daily dose before 9 a.m. Large doses may have to be divided. Oral glucocorticoids usually are given with meals to limit GI irritation. Prednisone is the drug of choice for most disorders seen in primary care because of its medium duration, mineral, minimal mineral corticoid effect, and low cost. The initial dose may have to be high to achieve rapid control of symptoms, especially in life-threatening disease. To determine the minimum dose to be given during long-term therapy, the dose should be tapered periodically to, a point, to the point of worsening symptoms. Oral preparations are the cheapest formulations, although convenience packs 
are available, the higher cost may not warrant their prescription. As true miracle drugs, these products are remarkably inexpensive relative to many products on the market. So how um, do we monitor these patients? Short courses of therapy usually do not require lab tests. For long-term therapy, you need to determine a baseline weight, blood pressure, serum glucose, and serum potassium levels. Vitamin D levels should also be measured at the same time, both in adults who may develop vitamin D deficiency um, because glucocorticoid therapy in and children who may be particularly susceptible to vitamin D deficiency. Bone mineral density should be monitored and clinicians should talk about how to maintain bone health through diet, weight-bearing activity. You need to monitor for edema, weight gain, negative nitrogen balance, electrolyte imbalance, increased blood pressure, and other adverse effects. Additionally, monitor for signs and symptoms of disease exacerbation. Patients whose medication is being tapered after long-term therapy should be monitored for symptoms of steroid withdrawal and adrenal insufficiency. Children on long-term therapy should be followed closely for changes in rate of growth and continued attainment of developmental guide, um, milestones. For patient variables, geriatric patients, because the elderly are more prone to a certain potential catabolic adverse events, of steroid therapy, caution is required with this population. Osteoporosis, susceptibility to compression fractures, thinning of the skin, and atrophy of subcutaneous fat often are seen with aging. Steroid therapy may cause additive risks in these areas. Practitioners should use the lowest effective dose for the shortest effective time in the elderly. In pediatric patients, the potential for growth suppression is, the great, is of greatest concern. With the use of glucocorticoids in children, alternative day dosing, intermediate acting, intermediate acting preparations um, may minimize suppression of the activity of the APA access. A short course does not result in growth suppression. For those pregnant and lactating women, studies have not been done in humans to fully determine the level of safety in pregnancy. Glucocorticoids cross the placenta and appear, and appear in breast milk. Long-term use during the first trimester has been associated with 1% incidence of cleft palate. Women who have taken large doses of glucocorticoids during pregnancy should be advised to avoid breastfeeding and their infants should be monitored closely for evidence of hypoadrenalism. Doses of 20 milligrams per day or less of prednisone or prednisolone or 8 milligrams per day or less of methylprednisolone for short periods may not cause harm to the infant. Waiting three to four hours after ingestion before breastfeeding has also been uh, recommended. For patient education, t uh, the patient should take oral glucocorticoids with food to minimize GI upset. They should take single daily or alternate day doses before 9 a.m. to co coincide with timing of peak endogenous adrenal cortical activity. Self-monitor for signs of adverse effects and they should notify their practitioner if observed. They should anticipate certain common side effects that can be troubling but not serious. These include changes in mood, insomnia, and increased appetite. The patient should not abruptly discontinue the medication. They need to consult their health care provider if there's a reason to stop taking the drug. Uh, the patient should taper the dose slowly as directed. And while on long-term therapy, they should carry a wallet card that specifies the drug and dosage. When therapy is over, they should indicate date of discontinuation on the card and carry it for an additional year to indicate the possible need for supplementation during times of severe physiological stress. The patient should learn the signs of adrenal insufficiency and report them to the practitioner um, if noted as dosage is tapered or after medication is discontinued. Signs include fatigue, weakness, nausea, anorexia, weight loss, diarrhea, dyspnea, and dizziness. Patients with diabetes must closely monitor their serum glucose, changes in dosage of insulin and um, or oral agent may be needed. 
patients should avoid immunizations with live viruses such as smallpox and avoid close contact with people who have had recent live virus vaccines and they should not use in the presence of a systemic fungal infection. Looking at the specific drugs, there's hydrocortisone, which is a naturally occurring corticosteroid. All other drugs compared with hydrocortisone uh, in terms of activity. It exhibits glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid activity, making it most useful as a replacement therapy or supplementation for patients with adrenal suppression during times of physiological stress such as surgery. It's contraindicated for systemic fungal infections, known hypersensitivity, or serious infection except sepsis or tuberculosis. Um, other drugs in these class include the cortisone, prednisone, prednisolone, trimethylone, um, methylprednisolone, um, we also known as the medrol dose pack, dexamethasone, and betamethasone. Now we'll move on to um, thyroid medications. Thyroxin T4 is the mainstay of treatment for uncomplicated hypothyroidism. T4 or T3 is used for suppressive treatment for conditions such as thyroid cancer. Treatment of hypothyroidism and suppressive treatment for individuals with a history of thyroid cancer generally require lifelong replacement with thyroid hormone. Uh, so let's look at the um, drugs. We have the thyroid supplements such as levothyroxine, which is a synthetic T4, thyroid suppressants such as PTU, um, and adjunctive diagnostic tools for thyroid cancer, which is the thyroid tropone, tro tropin. These are indicated for hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism as a replacement therapy and pituitary thyroid stimulating hormone TSH suppression. This is for treatment of you thyroid goiters and management of thyroid cancer. A thyroid supplement serves to replace inadequate levels of endogenous T3 and T4. If an endogenous thyroid hormone is given to an euthyroid patient, endogenous secretion of TSH and TRH will be suppressed, as will the body's production of T3, T4. Basal metabolic rate and metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are increased by thyroid supplements. These drugs also exert a direct effect on tissue, such as um, increased myocardial contraction. A mechanism of action continued. The thyrogen is a recombinant DNA source of human TSH. It's useful in the management and treatment of thyroid cancer patients. It's diagnostic agent um, for adjunctive use in therm thyroglobulin testing with or without radioiodine imaging in follow-up of patients with thyroid cancer and allows patients with thyroid cancer who are on supplementation to avoid hormone withdrawal while undergoing um, diagnostic testing. So what are the treatment? Um, Principles for evidence-based recommendation, overt hypothyroidism, it's beneficial um, to use levothyroxine. Um, cardinal points of treatment, um, treat the hypothyroidism with levothyroxine. Dosage of all thyroid medications must be individualized. Doses, dosage is based on laboratory findings and the patient's clinical response. Treatment choice for hypothyroidism is T4.
It is a relatively has it has a relatively slow onset of action, and its effects are cumulative over several weeks. T3 has more rapid onset of action and dissipation of action. T3 may be be the preferred treatment for use in rapidly correcting a hypothyroid state in radioisotope scanning procedures and in thyroid cancer. No evidence shows that the addition of T3 to T4 supplements has any benefit except the very rare instances when patients cannot convert or metabolize T4 to T3. The re mean replacement dosage of levothyroxine is 1.6 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day, although the appropriate dosage varies among patients. The pace of treatment depends on the duration and severity of hypothyroidism and on whether other associated medical problems are present. The patient should undergo reassessment and the ther therapy should be titrated after an interval of four to six weeks following any change in levothyroxine brand or dose. Dosage should be titrated until a normal TSH is obtained. Adults younger than age 65 without coronary artery disease may begin with 50 to 100 micrograms per day. Elderly patients and those with coronary artery disease generally should be started on a daily dose of 25 micrograms. The usual maintenance dose is 75 to 150 micrograms per day. Thyroid hormone should be, should be administered as a single daily dose, preferably before breakfast. Levothyroxine doses are commonly measured in micrograms rather than milligrams to avoid confusion regarding the dosage. A correct dose is 75 micrograms, which is equivalent to 0.075 milligrams. The AACE emphasizes that many brands of levothyroxine are available, and these are not compared uh, against a levothyroxine standard. Bioequivalence of levothyroxine preparations is based on total T4 measurements and not on TSH levels. Therefore, bioequivalence is not the same as therapeutic equivalence. It is recommended that patients should receive the same brand of levothyroxine throughout their treatment. In general, dissected thyroid hormone, combinations of thyroid hormones, or triiodothyroid thyroid and should not be used as a replacement therapy. Again, many brands of levothyroxine are available that have not been compared against levothyroxine standards. Bioequivalence is based on total T4 levels and not on TSH. Bioequivalence is not the same as therapeutic equivalence. Patients should receive the same brand of levothyroxine throughout their treatment. Again, starting dosages, adults less than 65, 50 to 100 micrograms daily, elderly begin at 25 micrograms daily, and the usual dose is 75 to 100 micrograms daily. Medication should be administered early in the morning before breakfast. How do we monitor this medication? The test for T4 measures total thyroxine, both bound and unbound in the serum, free thyroxine, thyroxine F. T4 measures only unbound T4. Normally, only T4 must be measured. Thyroid binding globulin, TBG, is the protein to which thyroid hormones are bound. It can be measured directly by the TBG test. Resin T3, up, re -up, resin T3 uptake, or T3RU, is an indirect measure that is no longer used. If the patient has an abnormal TBG, Free T4 may have to be evaluated. Again, laboratory work is initiated before therapy and monitored every three to six weeks until you thor. All right. Usually measuring the TH TSH within four weeks, four to six weeks is sufficient. Full therapeutic effectiveness may be may not be achieved for three to six weeks. TSH and symptom review usually are monitored monthly until normal and stable. Annual evaluation is recommended um, 
Once maintenance therapy has been achieved, levels also should be evaluated whenever the patient experiences signs and symptoms that could be related to underdosage or overdosage. Patients with a history of thyroid cancer who have had partial or total removal of the thyroid gland must take thyroid hormone supplements to suppress endogenous levels of TSH and to regulate their metabolism. However, a high level of TSH in a patient's bloodstream is necessary for radioiodine imaging to detect remnant thyroid tissue or metastatic disease and for optimal safety of serum thyroglobulin testing to be achieved. In the past, patients have had to stop taking their hormone supplements for two to six weeks prior to testing, causing them to experience symptoms of thyroid deficiency. Thyrogen, which is a recumbent form of TSH, allows the patients to avoid hormone withdrawal and, is, and its debilitating effect while the, they are undergoing diagnostic testing. Specifically, thyrogen is a new diagnostic agent for adjunctive use in thi serum thyroglobulin testing with or without radioiodine imaging in the follow-up of patients with well-differentiated thyroid cancer. Children younger, three, uh, younger than three years of age should be maintained on the upper end of the T4 therapeutic range with a normal serum TSH. It is recommended that children undergo laboratory assessment of medication effectiveness every one to two months for the first year of life, then every two to three months from, year, from one to three years of age, and then every three to 12 months thereafter. Geriatric patients, um, hypothyroidism is common in the elderly. A typical presentation includes CHF. Administration of thyroid hormone may exacerbate cardiovascular disease, particularly angina in elderly patients. It's advisable to start slow at 25 micrograms and gradually increase the dose. Absorption of the drug may increase with aging, so dosage adjustments may be required. Another common finding with patients um, with hyperthyroidism is um, atrial fibrillation. For pediatric patients, thyroid function is a paramount for normal growth and development, especially of the central nervous system in children. At-risk neonates should undergo FT4 and TSH screening as soon as possible after birth. Diagnosis and treatment of congenital hypothyroidism are essential in preventing creatinism. It is expected that children will require higher doses of medication to meet the metabolic demands of growth and development during the first three years of life. In congenital hypothyroidism, therapy may be stopped for two to eight weeks after the patient reaches three years of age. If TSH remains, levels remain normal, thyroid supplementation may be discontinued permanently. For those pregnant and lactating women, um, it's considered a category A. Excretion of thyroid medications in breast milk is minimal. Adjustment of thyroid hormone supplementation is common during pregnancy because of the increased energy demands. Um, for this reason, you need to closely monitor your pregnant women's um, TSH levels. For patient education, you need to inform the patient um, or caregiver that the response to this medication is not immediate. Symptoms should improve within two weeks. Thyroid deficiency is gener generally requires lifelong therapy. Taking the medication and ensuring compliance with therapy is extremely important. One must not alter the dose or abruptly stop the medication unless directed by their primary care provider. And changing the brand of medication should be avoided because of the potential variability in bioequivalence between manufacturers. The medication should be taken approximately the same time each day. The preferable time of day is before breakfast or on an empty stomach to increase absorption. Taking the medication too late in the day may make it difficult to, for the patient to sleep. Signs and symptoms of overdosage or thyroid toxicosis or underdosage hypothyroidism should be reported to the healthcare provider immediately.
looking at thyroid suppressants. Um, this is for hyper, uh, this is, these medications are used for hyperthyroidism. Um, and unlabeled uses include PTU, um, useful in alcoholic liver disease in reducing the hepatic hypermetabolic state induced by alcohol. Mechanism of action through diversion of iodine thyroid hormone synthesis is inhibited. PTU, but not methamazole, also inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3 in the tissues. Through re reduced absorption of iodine, thyroid hormone synthesis is diminished. As the thyroid gland becomes depleted of hormones, tissue concentrations will drop and then metabolic rate decreases. However, medications do not inhibit stored or circulating levels of T3 or T4. Thyroid suppressant agents do not affect oral and parental thyroid supplements. Normal thyroid hormone synthesis resumes rapidly with uh, cessation of therapy. PTU also inhibits conversion of T4 to T3 in peripheral tissues different from methamizole. This speeds conversion to a euthyroid state. Methamizole has the advantage of being longer acting. It therefore requires less frequent dosage schedule and may enhance compliance. Uh, for cardinal points of treatment, first line treatment for Graves' disease and toxic multinodular goiter, radioactive iodine. Pre-treatment with an anti-thyroid medication is indicated for elderly patients and those with cardiovascular disease. Second line includes surgical intervention. And third line, anti-thyroid drugs such as methamazole, um, preferred to propyl biouracil, except during the first um, trimester of pregnancy. Rest, adequate diet, and avoidance of occupational and domestic stress are other therapeutic modalities. Radioactive iodine is the usual treatment. Surgery is an option for patients who cannot tolerate or refuse radioactive iodine. Thyroid suppressants are an option for patients who cannot tolerate either option. Anti-thyroid drugs are pers prescribed to achieve remission of symptoms. Remission rates are variable and symptom relapses are frequent. Remission is most likely to, co to occur in patients with mild hyperthyroidism and small goiters. Pre-treatment with an anti-thyroid drugs before radioiodine therapy may be necessary for some elderly or cardiac patients. Some endocrinologists prefer antithyroid drug therapy in childhood Graves' disease. Primary hypothyroid, hyperthyroidism during pregnancy is one clear indication for antithyroid drug treatment. These drugs will control excessive production of thyroid hormone in all, almost all cases of thyrotoxicosis. Up to one half of patients will experience a permanent remission. However, relapse is frequent. Temporary hypothyroidism may occur with overtreatment. Antithyroid drugs will restore an euthyroid state in four to eight weeks. Although symptoms will improve sooner, usually one to, in one to two weeks, the patient should be euthyroid before surgery. Antithyroid drugs may be required before and after radioiodine therapy. Titration of dosage to gain maximal therapeutic response with the lowest dosage is the objective. Generally, therapy is maintained for 12 to 18 months. Once the patient has been euthyroid for 6 to 12 months, a decision may be made to reduce dosage and ascertain whether a remission has occurred. If remission is achieved, therapy is discontinued. Consultation and referral to a, a physician uh, who specializes in this is warranted during treatment initiation and when the decision is made to maintain or end therapy. Beta adrenergic blocking drugs such as propanolol or atenolol can be used to control the signs and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis that are related to sensitization of the sympathetic nervous system. Beta adrenergic blocking drugs should be used cautiously in patients with asthma or heart failure.
Once clinical evidence shows that hyperthyroidism has been resolved, an elevated TSH level indicates the need to lower dosage. Laboratory blood work should be done before antithyroid therapy is initiated and periodically once a patient is on a maintenance dose. Serum T4 and T3 levels are monitored initially and after three to six weeks of therapy until a youth thyroid state is achieved, usually in three to five months. Once clinical evidence of thyroid toxicosis has been resolved, an elevated TSH level indicates a need to lower the dosage. Before treatment is initiated, a white blood cell count with differential is done. It's repeated with any sign of infection. Some recommend routine monitoring of the white blood cell for at least the first three months of ter therapy. Monitor prothrombin time during therapy, especially before surgical proce procedures are performed with the potential for hepatotoxicity, AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, LDH, bilirubin, and PT may, may also may be evaluated. During each visit, visit, monitor for signs and symptoms of infection, as well as correction of the hypermetabolic state, such as decreased pulse, decreased blood pressure, weight gain, elimination of nervousness, or tr and tremors. Evaluate for hepatitis, agranulocytosis, and GI irritation. Again, monitoring for hepatotoxicity and each visit, signs of infections, decreased pulse, blood pressure, weight gain, elimination of nervousness and tremor. For geriatric patients, elderly individuals are less likely to experience thyrotoxicosis than hypothyroidism. Thyrotoxicosis in the elderly may have an atypical presentation consisting of symptoms such as lassitude, anorexia, and palpitations, often consistent with atrial fibrillation. For pediatric patients, PTU hepatotoxicity has occurred. Discontinuation immediately um, needs to be done if some signs and symptoms of hepatic dysfunction become apparent. For those pregnant and lactating women, um, this is considered a category D. Thyroid suppressants cross the placenta and can induce a goiter or cretinism. PTU generally is preferred if the drug is necessary. They can be effective if used judiciously. In many pregnant women, thyro, thy, thy, thyrotoxicosis diminishes as the pregnancy proceeds, making dosage reduction or discontinuation of the drug possible. An endocrinologist usually follows these patients. Thyroid suppressants should not be given while the patient is breastfeeding. For patient education, inform the patient um, or caregiver to avoid the ingestion of substances that contain iodine, such as seafood and ionized salt. Notify uh, the practitioner if any illness or unusual signs or symptoms occur. They need to report any fever, sore throat, malaise, unusual bleeding, bruising, headache, skin rash, or enlargement of cervical lymph, lymph nodes. For thyrotropin, these are indicated uh, for post-surgical evaluation of patients requiring follow-up for a remnant thyroid tissue, thyroid cancer recurrence, or metastasis. Um, this is used in conjunction with or without radioiodine imaging. Its mechanism of action enhances sensitivity of thyroglobulin um, testing in patients maintained on thyroid or hormone therapy. So again, the specific drugs, levothyroxine, T4, T4 also known as Synthroid or Levothyroid, Levo-T. Uh, these are contraindicated and untreated thyrotoxicosis, uncorrected adrenal insufficiency because they may precipitate adrenal crisis, recent MIs, hype or hypersensitivity to any of the medications. Um, you need to be precautionary um, for any inappropriate use of thyroid supplement to manage for the management of obesity or fertility. Patients with known cardiovascular disease should be monitored. Um, 
diabetes mellitus and diabetes sepidus may be aggravated by initiation of these drugs. You need to closely monitor and accordingly modify treatments. Um, and you, again, use precautions with patients with recent MIs. There are many drug interactions, um, overdosage, toxicities, evidenced by signs and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis and may mimic thyrotoxicosis, decrease or temporarily discontinue levothyroxine for approximately five to seven days, and then resume at a lower dose. Again, T3, um, cetamol or triostate, um, thyroid suppressants um, for thyrotoxicosis, PTU, and adjunctive therapy um, such as um, a diagnostic tool for cancer.